I want to talk tonight about the complete lubrication. So the complete lubrication was our most popular service when I ran the shop at University Motors. We'd get cars in that hadn't run for 30 years. We'd get cars that, that uh, we got, we had one guy come in, he'd come in every 12,000 miles and he was using his MGB for primary transportation. So he came in twice in one year, I remember that. Um, and his charge cards would only take so much. So we'd have to put 37 bucks on one charge card, 52 on another, and <laughs> it was a hoot, but he was a, he was a believer. The complete lubrication is more than a lube oil and filter. I mean, when you take your car in, you get a lube oil and filter. Um, you know, they, they pump some grease in the front suspension, at least into uh, five of the six circs, because maybe they don't see the one on the back side on the left. Um, and they change the oil and filter, and there you go. So I'll ask customers when they when they have just recently purchased a car, and they say, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's all been serviced. And I'll say, well, is there oil in the differential? Is there oil in the gearbox? And the customer will say, well, I guess so. I said, well, yeah, there probably is too, probably. But if there isn't, you know, it's going to fail on you at an, at an indeterminate point. And it's going to be really expensive to have the car towed and upsetting and yada, yada, yada. So why not just do a complete lubrication now, especially if you've just purchased a car and it gives you a ground zero for all the, all the future maintenance. So I described this, it rolls off my lips pretty easily is front to rear, side to side, uh, top to bottom lubrication, inspection and adjustment. And that's what it is. If anyone went on to the link that I provided um, in the, I think I did on the, um, email letter that I sent out yesterday. Um, take a look at this, it's two pages. It took us six hours, usually more, because you do some, some light repair while you're in there. Um, but it takes us six hours to do a complete lubrication. So nominally, I mean, when I was, when I was running the shop, we finally got, to, I think, to about 100 bucks an hour, 100 and maybe a little change on top of that. So there's 600 bucks. And then there's oils and filters and everything. So you didn't, you didn't get out of a complete loop for less than 800 bucks. There's a lot of money, especially if you just bought the car and you stretched yourself to buy it. But boy, I mean, it's just, I'm going to go through it right now um, for those of you who didn't take a look at it and just go through it and, and tell you everything that we did. And you can understand why it was so valuable to the owner and to us too. People might say, well, you know, I, I, I got to get my engine rebuilt. My engine's tired. We've already talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Um, but what about the brakes? What about the shocks? What about the rack and pinion? What about the lights? What about everything else? This looks at the whole car, does not look at the engine, looks at the oil pressure on the engine. But the tune-up is, is, something, is something different. So I want to start on the lube. So here I've got, I printed out the lube. You know, it, 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 it uh, came out in lots of different forms. Uh, when, when we had it, I tried to reduce it to one page when we were doing it, but we finally did front, uh, print front and back because there was just too, too much information to collect. So when you start off with a car, the goal is to go out and drive it and see what's going on, service it, and then go out and drive it again. If the car hasn't driven for 25 years, you can't go out and drive it. So you have to you have to jump through or not do the first things on the list, but come around later on once it is operational and do those things then. So the first thing we do is inflate the tires. I use 30, 32, 30 in the front, 32 in the back. You can use whatever you want. I was just thinking how much fun it would be to take my MGA and drop the tires down to 22, 24, and run it on, a, on exactly on like a pint of gasoline and see how far I got, and then go 24, 26, and then go 26, 28, and then 28, you know, 30, and just see how it is. If you're underinflated, um, it feels like you're in a um, earthquake, cars 
shade is moving all over the road by itself. And if they're too hard, you wear the it's it's a harsh ride, and you also wear the tires out, wear the tread out. But that's the first thing you do is inflate inflate the tires. Um, then, depending, but you take it out for a test drive. You want to know what the oil pressure is at idle. Not that it makes a whole lot of difference. And you want to know what it is when you're running down the road. And all of our cars, TC through 1980 MGB, not the V8s, not the MGCs, um, should be around 60 to 75 pounds when you're driving down the road. Um, if it's not that high, if it's under 50, either there's a problem recording the number, get, getting the correct number, especially on T-types, um, but you don't want to drive the car if it's under 50 pounds. You need, you need 50 pounds to protect the, the bearings from the crank and the crank from the bearings. So then you come back, bring it into the shop, and you check the shocks. It says test operation of the dampers. Put your hands on the, on the front fender and bounce it up and down. It either bounces with great restriction or it bounce, 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 bounce meaning that the shocks are bad. Um, now you check the, the road springs. So you take out a tape measure, measure from the ground. I always measure from the ground because that's easy. There's a natural stop there to the bottom of the chrome strip. And you record that height on the, on the form. Anomaly, you want the same height on all four corners. Over a period of time, the left rear of the, of the car that's in our country, left-hand drive, the left rear of the car sags because that's where all the, all the weight is. Uh, I expect it in England, it's the right-hand side that, that sags. So when the, when the left rear sags, the right front rises. Sometimes it's traumatic. You look at the front of the car and you go, what's going on here? You know, oh, you need coil springs. You don't need coil springs, you need leaf springs. That'll, that'll level it back out. Coil springs is a rule, don't, don't go bad. Then the road wheels. So there's lots of stuff to look at on the wheels. Lots of stuff to take a look at. You got disc wheels, you got wire wheels. Um, if you've got um, wire wheels, then you have an associate step on the brakes on the inside of the car and you grab the wheel and you move it. Then it moves on the splines. If you tighten up the spinner and then try to move it, it won't move on the splines. But after you've gone out and driven the car, It'll move. The question is how much, right? And it's just a judgment. It's hard to measure. You know, it's just a judgment that, that you make. For whatever reason, the right-hand side of the car seems to wear more than the left side. Is that because you get it, the, the spinner tightens in the opposite direction? I don't know. I don't know. But I do know that the right-hand side wears a little faster. So <clears throat> uh, you're going to check the trueness of the tire. So the tire right in front of you, you spin it, you spin it so that you're watching it go round and round and you're just watching it and you're seeing if it's doing this. Then you stand on the side and see if it's doing this. Is this going around? And you put your hand on it and you spin it and you feel for scallops and lumps. If you've got scallops or lumps on the, on the tire, meaning that it's not flat, you can put 15 pounds of weight on the tire and it's still good. It, it'll balance up perfectly on the balancing machine. But when you go down the road, it, it's going to vibrate fiercely because the, the wheel isn't round. No wheel is perfectly round. For those of you with wire wheels, you can sell, send them off to Alan Hendricks in, uh, hmm. Mm. Tri City area, North North Carolina. Where, where's that, Judge? Greensboro. Where, where's that? Greensboro, North Greensboro. Carolina. Greensboro. Thank you. North Carolina, and Judge Judge's got a um, a machine that'll true wire wheels and get them absolutely, absolutely round. It's like driving on glass. You want to record the size of the tires. You know the original tires were pretty thin, pretty narrow. Um, the MGAs used um, 155 if, if they were, well, they started off with, with uh, 550, 5.50 um, bias plies. And, but when they ramped those up to radials, they came up with 155s. 
Um, but we used to see like two 15s on an MGB. And those, those tires were just massive. It's just crazy town. Um, but you know, you, you want to, you want to get a, a, a measurement and you also want to write down the date code on the tire because now that's all exciting. And geez, if the tire's over 10 years old, you don't want to drive on it. Well, it depends what kind of driving you're doing, but, um, and tires are today are so much better than tires used to be. Um, but this is all information that, that you gather. Um, the tire sizes, the date code, and the and the depth of the depth of the tread. You use a penny, see how much of Lincoln you see, or you can buy a tire gauge and actually with a little uh, um, sliding sliding rule, and you can tell exactly how how deep the the tread is. That's the road wheels. Now we put the guy up on the up on the well. He's already up on the hoist because we, we've already been spinning the tires. Now we take a look at the rear suspension, and we look at the springs in the back. Are they separated over a period of time? The the um, the leaves move away from each other, and you know that that the springs are getting getting crummy. I look at the rear shocks, you grab the shock, shock link, try to move it up and down. Now, this, the rear suspension is hanging, so it's under stress. So it can be that, um, that the shock link won't shake because it's tight on, on, on both ends. Um, better if you can put a, uh, like a transmission jack underneath the differential and take a little bit of load off the rear axle, and then grab those shock links and shake them. I tell the story that, that I had a customer with a 1500 midget and she called me up and she said, John, my car makes it sound like a chicken. I said, Wendy, I'm game. Drive down and let's see what this chicken is. And we went around the block and sure enough, that thing, every time we hit a bump, it went cluck, 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 cluck. It was a hoot. Um, it was just, and it was a rear shock link that, that, that was loose, but it did, I mean, it did sound like a chicken. Um, you can find that. That's why you take the car out for a test drive first to listen for noises and, and, uh, and, and see what might be going on. And then you can take a look later. Tighten the rear anti-sway bar. A 1977 through 1980 has a rear anti-sway bar that comes loose a lot and it goes clack, clack every time you accelerate and decelerate. Just tighten it up, that goes away. Now, with it up on the hoist, you drain out the engine, the gearbox, and the differential, and tighten up the filter head, the filter head that attaches up to the bottom of the bottom of the uh, engine. If you've got a uh, filter that hangs down, then obviously you're, you're not going to do that, but 70 through 80, that's most of the cars out there. But the filter heads can and do come loose, and they weep a little bit. So just it, you can get a half a turn out of it, usually if it hasn't been tightened before. Then we take apart the rear brakes, take, take the drums off, um, inspect the piston movement. That means that someone sit, you'd only do one at a time, one side at a time. Someone's sitting inside the car and they very gently press on the brake pedal and uh, you're, holding, you're holding the shoes with a great big screwdriver and uh, you, yep, one side, of the, one side of it moves and the other side of it moves and you check underneath the boot, you make sure that the cylinder isn't leaking, make sure that's all right, then you can go ahead and, you know, make sure that the springs and everything are, are in place correctly. Um, sand the shoes, sand the drums, not while well, you're breathing all that stuff, you know, even though it's not asbestos anymore, it can't be good. Lubricate the adjusters, that means run the adjusters all the way back out, lube them, lube them, and uh, when you're all set, you know, put the put the uh, drums back on and then readjust the rear brakes. MGBs do not have self-adjusting rear brakes. MGCs do sometimes. <laughs> You're supposed to have them, um, and then it's also um, with the rear brakes um, you want to adjust the handbrake. And you're supposed to lube the handbrake. I don't see that on, on here. Um, but lubing the handbrake cable can be as complicated as three people 
one person inside pulling up and up and then letting the, the handle go down, one person in the back with the left rear of the handbrake disconnected, and he's got vice grips on the cable pulling the handbrake off, and someone in the middle with a grease gun very slowly pushing grease into the cable. And if you do that for five minutes, that cable is going to be nice and free. So, and then you, after that, you can adjust the handbrake. Take a look at the drive shaft, the propeller shaft, and make sure that it's in correct alignment, that the, the U joints are, are, um, are parallel. Sometimes they're off. Um, feel the drive shaft, make sure it hasn't got any, any uh, great big dents in it from hitting something or somebody changed a U joint in the past and put it in a vise and crunched down on it. And, and that thing's spinning at engine speed. So if you're doing 3,600 RPM, that drive shaft's doing 3,600 RPM. And if it's not in balance, the whole car shakes. So it, it's really dramatic. Um, you want to make sure the gearbox mounts are okay. Lube, the U, U, lube up the U-joints and the slip joint down there. Tighten up the flange bolts, a pair of half-inch wrenches, and just make sure that the bolts that hold the drive shaft to the back of the gearbox and to the front of the diff are tight. This list goes on. I'm going to be reading for a little bit here. Then we take a look at the fuel system, inspect the fuel tank, sending unit, pump, the lines. Just make sure it's not weeping. Make sure nothing, something's, you know, all set to fall apart, something like that. Then we take a look at the exhaust. Make sure the hangers are there, that it's, it's firmly in place. Look for holes. If you've got an ice pick, you can, and the, and the muffler looks kind of crappy, uh, you can go at it with, a, with an ice pick, and if, if it's crappy, it'll, it'll perforate pretty easily. Lots of the new exhausts, of course, are, are um, stainless. They don't sound right. They're, they're too noisy, all of them, but, um, but they're guaranteed for, for life and, and you, know, you just have to, have to get used to the sound. Then we're moving towards the front of the car and the next thing is the, is the air vent bulb right underneath the air vent, which sits in front of the windscreen behind the bonnet. You know, it, it's uh, that big and it sits horizontal and, and lots of water gets in there and there's a drain to let the water out. But that drain gets filled with twigs and leaves and dirt and dead mice parts and all kinds of stuff. So we used to take our big blow gun, go underneath, find it, put the blow gun in there, and all this stuff would, would, would flower out of the top of the, of the air vent, and then you'd have to blow the top of the car off. But that, that, keeps, that keeps that cleaned out. MGB only? Yes, that's the, yeah, and MGC. Not midget. Not a midget. That, that's, that's got a, a different air inlet system. And then, uh, then we go ahead and, and fill the differential. And of course, on my, my chart here, it says 8090, um, but it's GL4, gear lube number four. You, if you have to, you can use gear lube number five, but some people say that something's in that number five oil, the gear oil, that will begin to eat away at brass and copper parts. And there are brass and copper parts in both the, both the engine and the, and the gearbox. No, what will happen if you use the 8090 instead? Well, 8090 is, is the is correct, and that's but it's like used to be called hypoid gear oil. Used to be called hypoid gear oil. Now it's it, now it's sold as GL four and GL five. It's just a, a change in the in the designation. Still eighty ninety. Then we take a look at the front suspension. We look at the kingpin. John. Yes. Uh, just a question. Are you saying fill the differential or change it out if it's been years? No, I, we, we already drained it. We already drained it about 16 steps ago. So we, we must refill it. Okay. I, I, missed, I missed the draining part. It's okay. That's right. If you look at the list, you'll see it. Just like I didn't used to. And then Jim Kircheski, 
uh, uh, Chicago, uh, Chicago, early Chicagoland MG member was working for me for a while. And he said, well, you, you drain everything else. Why wouldn't you drain the differential? And I said, you're right. We ought to drain the diff. Now on a TR6, there's no drain. There's a boss for it on the, on the differential housing. There's no drain. So on a TR6, you have to drill up into the bottom of the diff and then, and then uh, open it up to a quarter inch hole and tap it one quarter NPT. And then when you're all done, put in a quarter inch pipe plug. That's the way you, you clean out a, a TR6 diff. But no, I mean, there's, there's water and oil and, and God knows what, you know, or who knows how much of what in those differentials. And that's, that's why this is called a complete loop because you know, it's complete. About how much does a B hold? The diff, a yeah. couple pints, about a quart, that's all. Okay. Does that Thank oil you. also go out into the uh, rear axle? It, when you go around a corner, the oil slips one side to the other, and that's what that's what lubricates the, the rear axle bearings. Okay, thank you. That, that's all, probably all of them? Yep, and, and the, the same axle bearing that fits a 1950 TD fits a 1980 MGB. Interesting. I love the, wow. I love that continuity. I love the continuity. Um, so we just refilled the the, uh, the differential in the gearbox. Now we're up at the front suspension. A lot to look at up here, absolutely. So we inspect the kingpins. The wheels are still on the car. So you grab the wheel at 12 and 6 and you shake it. And it's going to move. It, it's, it's tongue, 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 tongue. It's going to move. It's either the bearings or the kingpin. You can put your shoulder up underneath the wheel and lift up and down on the wheel and see if the if the kingpin moves, uh, if the stub axle moves on, on the kingpin, you shouldn't be able to feel it. So these are all just, it, it'll never break off. It'll never fall out, out of the car, no matter how bad they get. They get real bad, bunk, bunk, bunk. I mean, they they move a lot. And and it's it's change, it changes the, the camber. But it doesn't ever it doesn't ever break, so you don't have to worry about that. But it's just you know if you want the car to handle well and be responsive and so forth, you know at some point you got to take care of the kingpins. Um, there's distance tubes underneath. As the kingpin moves up and down, there's a arms on the bottom that that follow that, and this has to pivot at the. I'm trying to show this has to pivot at the bottom. So there's the A arms come down and there's a distance tube between them and the and the kingpin uh, the, the kingpin sits around that so this whole thing can can move and over a period of time they freeze up that's why I had a picture of that front suspension bolt um, so that when they freeze up then the bolt start something has to move the bolt starts to move and then it it, it cuts slices in the bolt you can see that very clearly because the bolt's no longer centered in the in the A arm. The AR bushings are almost always toast, to use the common breakfast expression. Uh, the tie rod ends, you can feel those, see if, if those are okay. The inner tie rod ends is part of the steering. Uh, you put your hand up there and, and move the wheel a bit. There should be no clay for the tie rod where it goes into the rack. There should be no clay there at all, non-zero. Um, and you also, while you're up there, tighten the shocks. Again, this is MGB, but you can use this, this list for an MGA or a, a midget. Um, you want to tighten the shocks. The shocks can and do come loose. It's absolutely, you know, you think, well, that was all put on. It's all nice and tight. You put a wrench on there, you can get half a turn. You can get, sometimes you get two turns. You know, and you go, oh, my gosh. And the looser they are, the more they work and the more things start to fail. So. I only know one guy who lost his shock while he was driving. Just talked to him the other day. He lives in Alabama now. He used to live in Illinois. Um, we want to lubricate the kingpins. You don't lube them first because if you lube them first, you can't feel the play because the, the the grease fills up all the all the uh, all the empty space. So that's why I'm I'm telling you to follow it in this order. Top off the front shocks with shock oil, you can buy it from Moss, I think probably from, from Ed Cook at Abingdon. And I had a, I've got a dedicated oil can 
with a little um, piece of 3 16 tubing on the end on a, on a piece of uh, rubber line and you take, you take the, uh, the nut, the filler nut out of the front shock, hook this thing in, glug, 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 glug until it, until it pisses out and then put the, put the nut, to, uh, put the bolt back in. It's a 516 British bolt. It's one of the only British, one of the only British threads left in the whole car. So anyway, you want to use shock oil to fill that up. It's hydraulic fork oil. You can buy it at the motorcycle shop. Buy the heaviest stuff you can get, makes up for the wear. Originally it's 20 weight, but we we had it made up for us in 50 weight uh, to uh, to put in the shock to make up for the for the wear that, that was going on. Uh, let's see what else up front. We're going to take a look at the at the flexible brake lines and the steel brake lines. Shouldn't be anything wrong with them, but the flex lines flex lines are now good for about ten years. Beyond that, you want to change them. Now the front wheel bearings on an MGB. I had a picture of that in the email that I sent out. Um, it's not like an American one where you tighten up the nut until it freezes up and then back it off until you can drop a split pin through it. That'll work. I, I don't. I don't think I've ever seen a snapped. I've seen one. I have one snapped stub axle on an MGB. But there's a proper way to do it, and it has to do with shims. And that front nut on the MGB is supposed to be a breaker bar and body weight, 140 pounds or something to torque on that. You want it really tight, and yet. You had, end up having uh, end float, two to three thousandths of end float. So if it's not greased and you feel it, because you always feel it before you take it apart and grease it, because that the the grease is run run pretty pretty uh, dry on it. You grab the front hub and you move it in and out of the car, and you also spin it. Um, it should spin absolutely freely. And you should be able to feel the tiniest, just the tiniest tunk, okay? If you put a dial indicator on it, magnetic dial indicator, um, you come up with two or three thousandths of, of end float. So you remove the brake pads so you can feel the, the, the end float, inspect the end float, and then on the MGB, this is so handy, you only have to, to knock the outer, the outer um, bearing loose and grease it, and then you can put it back in. You don't have to grease the inner wheel bearing. The inner wheel bearing never runs out of grease. That one stub axle that I talked about that I'd seen that had snapped had dried up in the outer bearing had got red hot, I don't know, red hot, maybe something or other, and snapped the stub axle. But on that car, the only car I ever saw with a sna sta snapped stub axle, there was still plenty of grease on the inner wheel bearing because uh, it's bigger in diameter and the centrifugal force takes it, I don't know, it beats me. But rather than take the whole thing apart, we just we just greased up, you know, put the grease in your palm and you push the grease through the through the uh, tape, through Timken uh, taper bearing, and push that back on. If you got disc wheels, it's a dream. If it's wire wheels, oh my gosh, now all the way down in there, it's just tedious. It's just tedious. I'll tell you that. So anyway, and then you got to get that that uh, end float set up correct. So then, with the with the um, pads. You take one, you put one pad back in, and you get your associate to sit in the car and pump up the brakes with a couple of screwdrivers between the brake rotor and the brake pad, and the pad pushes out, and then finally hits the it hits the um, the couple of screwdrivers you've got there. So then you you flush the outside of that piston with brake fluid and squeeze that piston back into the caliper, pump it out again. Flush it with brake fluid, push it back in again, pump it out three times, each one three times. When you're done on on with one of them, put the brake pad back in. You don't have to lay it in vertically, just put it in horizontally so that it can't move. 
and then um, go ahead and, and do the next one. You've got you've got the four you've got the four pistons up there, and you want to you want to exercise those. You want to get them moved out and back in, out lubed and back in, a couple of times. So that that ensures that they're moving. Our calipers hardly ever fail. I know some ca some calipers do fail. I know people change calipers a lot. I don't think it's necessary. That's just me. Um, um, but it, it also churns up the brake fluid. It really, really churns up the brake fluid. So we've we've exercised the front calipers. Now we're going to bleed the rears and bleed the fronts. And when you go to bleed the fronts, you get goopy, nasty goopy brake fluid with all kinds of little bits of black in it, and it's like yuck, yuck city. But now you've got fresh brake fluid in there. You've got to change the brake fluid um, frequently, or at least bleed it to get rid of the water that gets into the brake fluid and then, and then separates and lies at the bottom and causes rust. Let's see, then we're going to, um, oh, it's here that we exercise lube and adjust the handbrake, even though I had adjust the handbrake before. The rack and pinion, now you've got the bellows on either side, but there's a there's a plate on the top. T-types, there's a nut. Midgets, there's a nut. Um, MGCs, there's a plate. You take that plate off, and all the shims take out the thinnest shim, drool gear oil in there, 80, 90 gear oil. Have your associate turn the wheel lock to lock. I've got a YouTube video up about that. And when it's when it's Full, that it's barfing out as much oil as you're putting back in, you can stop there. You can be all exacting and measure it all out and everything, but um, you want plenty of oil in, in the rack and pinion, not grease. T-types and MGAs have got what appears to be a grease nipple on the rack and pinion. You take it in, some guy puts it up there and he can get a, he can put a whole tube, he can put two tubes of grease in your rack and pinion and then it starts really sluggish um, I had a guy call me from Jackson, Michigan, not too long ago. He said, I got my car back from my LOF, the oil filter. He said, the steering, the steering is so heavy now. I said, you're just going to have to take the boots off and wipe the grease off. And when you get sick of doing that, then go ahead and, and introduce gear oil back in there. Um, the bonnet cable, that's up next. The bonnet cable, you want to lube. The, the whole distance of the bonnet cable, you can buy spray glue. Excuse me, not glue, grease. You can, see, I'm gonna hit my mute all. We got a little background noise here. Okay. Um, and um, um, so you can buy spray grease. You can spray the entire length of the bonnet cable with that grease on a midget, especially a midget, because the cable goes underneath the battery and right underneath the battery is where it, it, it gets all garbaged up there, gets all corroded. So just flush the whole outer sheath of the cable with some kind of spray grease. You can get spray clear grease, spray white grease, might as well get clear grease and then you, you don't see it. Um, then we've got heater and vent controls. So you want to make sure those are operating correctly. Again, you spray them, turn them, make sure they're, they're working. If they're not working, you can, you know, the whole point of this lube is to tell the owner, hey, this isn't working and it needs more attention. You don't necessarily stop and fix it right there. There's also a fresh air vent on an MGB behind the, behind the radio console that's got a handle on it, tonk, tonk, open, tonk, tonk, closed. And uh, you got to get in there, you got to see it, hit it with that spray grease and uh, get the hinges and get the roller and that'll work more easily. Underbonnet, we're gonna top off the master cylinders now. Um, we're gonna put oil in the carburetors, washer solvent. We're, we're gonna tighten up the fan belt if it needs to be tightened. How do you know if it needs to be tightened? because you grab a hold of the alternator or generator pulley and attempt to turn it anti-clockwise as seen from the front. The whole system runs clockwise. Um, so it's never gonna, it's never gonna slip clockwise. Can't, and then gonna slip clockwise. It's only gonna slip counterclockwise. So just try to turn it counterclockwise. If you can do that, it's too loose. 
Take a look at the engine mounts, 74 and a half through 80. Engine mounts tear out a lot. Lots of trouble with those. Uh, replace the oil filter at this point. Refill the engine. Now we're done with page one. And it's already 744. I'm talking, I got to speed up here. So on the cooling system, I never upgraded the complete lube to include draining, flushing, and refilling the cooling system. But I would do that today. My lube list does not include doing that. It's just checking the antifreeze and, and going for it. And loosening and retightening all the hose clamps. On a midget 1500, there are something like 15 hose clamps. So you put a screwdriver in it, you tighten it. You go, oh, that's tight. No, you don't know it's tight. It, it, you know it's frozen. You know it won't turn. So unscrew it, shoot it with some grease, tighten it back up. Make sure it's nice and tight. Um, lube the cooling fans. What does that even mean? 77 through 80. Uh, you know, some those of you who've had, had those cars, have those cars, you know that when the starter or the, the uh, uh, cooling fan motor starts to fail, it squeals like a stuck pig. Eee! It's awfully embarrassing to be driving such a cool car and having this noise come out from underneath the bonnet. And if you just put a couple drops of oil on the shaft between the, the motor and the fan, some of that oil will wick back in and get into the bushing. Can't hurt. Fuse box, take it off the car. Take the wires off it, take it off the car. Take it over to your sandblaster, sandblast it. Don't have a sandblaster, take it in the house, use your kid's toothbrush. And, Brasso or, or put it into a bowl of ammonia, something or other, let it get really clean. When you go to put it back on, pay attention because the bridged connection goes at the top. If you put the bridged connection at the bottom, you can start the car, but you can't turn it off. So you'll know immediately that you've done, done something wrong. Um, and, over, and fuse the overdrive circuit. If you've got overdrive, overdrive was never originally um, fused. 63 through 80. And if you have overdrive, oh my gosh, please, please, please fuse that circuit with just an inline 10 amp fuse. Carburetor, now this is not a tune up, but we're doing a little beer. So we're going to take a look at the air filters. We're going to look at the fuel filters and the PCV lines. And on the 75 through 80s, tighten up the automatic choke on the, on the Stromberg carburetor. When those come loose, they drip gasoline. Uh, there were a lot of fires real early on, 75, 76 through 1980, maybe. A lot, of, a lot of cars burned up because those screws came loose. Wipers, take a look at the wipers. Um, replace the wiper blades as needed. Always put the new blade in front of the driver and move the other wipers down towards the passenger. Passenger doesn't have to see, but the driver sure does. Um, and you want to inspect the park position. Sometimes the park position is wrong on an MGA or an earlier midget. Uh, we got a can on top of the on top of the motor. You can adjust the park position um, and adjust the washers so they actually hit the bottom of the screen and don't fly over the top of the car. On the interior of the car, lubricate the seat rails. The seats actually move fore and aft. You don't want to use red grease. We used to I love red grease used to use red grease and I'd have customers call me and say, my wife just got red grease on her white pants. This is wrong. So we started using um, white grease or, or clear, clear grease. And move those, move those seats back and forth 20 times, whatever you have to. So they, so they just glide. So they just work really, really nicely. Um, tighten up the door strikers. Um, it, all the all the way, I, the MGAs, um, T types, but especially the MGBs, uh, 65 and newer. Uh, the, there's three screws that hold the striker onto the door, and and uh, three that hold the latch on on or whatever you want to call it the uh, on the door jam. But those those screws can and do come loose, so tighten those up. Get those really really snug. Uh, oil up the door latches. Everything works better with oil on. Tighten the door latches. Um, that is the the, um, uh, the push button. The push button. Sometimes the push buttons start to move out, and you got to go inside there with a three eighths wrench. It's about 
18 inches long. You've got a, our guys always had a, a piece of a welding welding rod um, welded onto a three inch wrench so you, you could adjust those. Um, tighten up the visors, geez, or take them off. No point in having visors there. Tighten up the rear view mirror, take it off, tighten it back, back up again and uh, tighten up the gear knob. Make sure it's straight. You don't want to have it say MG at four o'clock. You want it to say MG at 12 o'clock. You want it straight, get it nice and straight. The pedals, the pedals, adjust the free play on the pedal, the brake and clutch and the throttle. You can't adjust the, the free play on the clutch. You can, you can judge how much it is and if it's excessive. Open up the trunk, take a look at your toolkit. Oh my gosh, I've got a toolkit back there. Look at the jack. Put some grease or oil on the jack, run it up and down. You should never, ever use the factory jack, ever, <laughs> ever. You should get the, you know, a, a scissors jack that, that climbs up. But if you are carrying your factory jack, make sure it does, yes, it does work. So lubricate it. And while you're back there, um, um, make sure that the boot latch the push button is tight on the back side, and there's a there's a 2BA nut or bolt on the back side of the boot latch that can and does fall off. And then you can push it all day and nothing's gonna happen. You gotta open up the trunk some other way, which is a real, a real hassle. Inspect the tunnel, the, the half tunnel, the tunnel bars, and if necessary, replace the evaporative loss control lines back that go up to the um, Condensing canister in the right in the, in the uh, right rear fender, 70 through 80. Look at the soft top. Look at the old um, the soft top. Lift the dots and the windows, and tighten the the six screws that hold the soft top to the body. Tighten those up. Those come loose. Those come loose. Now pop off the battery. Pop off the battery cover and check the battery. Um, we took the battery out of the car, washed, washed it in soda, got it nice and clean, put it back, made sure it was tied in, put brand new battery clamps on it, unless the factory back clamps were just beautiful, or there were helmet clamps, and we're dealing with Mr. Original here. Those take longer to, to do. Uh, clean the cables, tie down, and then record the specific gravity. Gravity on a fully charged battery is 1250, 1.250. Um, but if you get if you get 1250, 1250, 1050, 1250, 1250, 12, you know you get a bad cell. And eventually you're going to have to change the the battery. The rear shocks you can fill those. Those are those are on the rear shelf back there under under some plugs about that big. Pop those off. You look straight down. There's a 516 British bolt there. Just Take that off and use your, your can that's got the shock oil in it and fill those off. Check the seat belts. Seat belts work? Do they recoil? Do they snap when you, when you pull them? Um, go to the exterior of the car and tighten up the antenna. Uh, are the door handles tight? Are the overriders tight or loose? Overriders get loose and they rattle and you're driving down the road and you get this ding, 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 ding. ding. And then as soon as you're out of the car, you for, it's like a headache. You forget they ever had it until you get back in the car again. And, and uh, so feel everything and just, if it's loose, tighten it up or at least figure out what, what you might do later on. Same thing with the, with the grill and the mirrors. Those outside rear view mirrors used to rattle a lot. You could touch them and the, and the glass would rattle in those things. Oh my gosh. So we, We'd pop out the little plastic insert, take a rag, I mean, part of a shop rag, tear it and have, ball it up, put it back in there, put the mirror in and put the, put the uh, uh, plastic thing back on and now the mirror is pressed up against the plastic and it wouldn't rattle. Then you check the operation of all the lights, high beams, low beams, uh, tail lights, stop lights, turn signals, side markers, license lights, just check them all because you never know that they're bad when you're sitting in the car, not, not until somebody yells at you. You have a fire extinguisher. That would be nice to have a fire extinguisher 
in the car. So just check that, make sure it's still uh, operational. And then when you're all done, take that car out for a test drive again, but make sure that you hit the brakes first, pump, 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 and pump the brakes up. Because if you've been working with those pads and they've got those pads drawn back and you start to move the car, the first hit of the brake pedal is gonna go right to the floor and the second and the third, maybe you get some brakes on the fourth. So just tap them and pump them up first so that you're not surprised when you're driving the car out. That was our most popular service. It, was like it would push a thousand bucks. And uh, rear brakes were our most common repair. But we find all kinds of things wrong and, and you, can, you can prioritize stuff. You get, you get a left rear, uh, left rear side marker that's out. Is that more important than the brakes? Nope. You know, so we used to put stuff in one, two, threes. You know, there's a tear in the soft top from having put it down incorrectly. So we could take the soft top off, take the header bar off, take it to our upholstery guy, have him stitch in the patch. Is that more important than oil in the rack and pinion or new boots on the rack and pinion? No. So you just have to prioritize all this stuff. So that's that's the complete loop. Our most popular service we did thousands of, of them and and uh, every car was was so much better for it once once i think maybe twice we stopped doing a loop part way through and said there's too much wrong there's just too much wrong and and it would be folly to continue without calling the customer you know saying it's folly to continue and then if he wanted to continue certainly we would have neither of the cases did we continue one was the car was just too rusty it was just too too beat up the other one well the other one was rusty too and the gal just purchased it and the guy had these cables underneath with turnbuckles on them, with uh, uh, great big long bolts that through the frame members to tighten up the the undercarriage oh my gosh we sent her packing she she got back in touch with the guy she just bought the car from and said I, you know this isn't as it appeared to be he was on the phone to us. He was upset. But those are the only two lubes I think that we ever started on and then didn't didn't complete. We had we had cars come in with no oil in the diff. One guy, Jay, Jay, I can't remember his last name. He came in, took the took the 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 drain plug out of the engine. Nothing dropped out. Ah, nothing came out. You know, if he'd driven another twenty miles, it, it would have been you know five thousand dollar. Uh, engine job. So, uh, complete loop. Anyway, I've talked for a long time here, and I, I didn't mean it's uh, it's almost eight, eight, eight o'clock, and uh, which is one sixth of the amount of time almost that it took us to to do the loop when we're flying. It takes two people. Got to have a hoist or you know up on all fours. It's uh, it's not for it's it's for the hail and hardy to do a job like this. So before I start on. Any questions on, on the chat section, let me answer any questions anyone might have uh, about the complete loop so you can un unmute yourself and just ask and we'll, we'll, go, we'll go with that first. John, I do want to. Yes. Peter, uh, you're, you're not unmuted. Hold your space bar down, Peter. There you John, go. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that reminder. Before you take that test drive, test the brakes before you move the car. I've seen it twice. Okay. Somebody started off and actually hit another car because the car had been sitting a while and the brakes weren't working. Yep. <laughs> okay. Most important part of the car is the brakes, the steering, and the brake lights. Yep. John, John, question about the fuse block. Yes, sir. You talked about cleaning it. Do you suggest putting dialectic grease between no. the fuse and the connectors? No, I don't. I don't. I don't use. Uh, I don't use the dielectric grease. I just do it. You know. I mean, it, it, you know, if you lived on the shore, you know, and you're always being bathed in salt water, maybe you can make a case for it. But you know, it, it, it's clean and dry. It'll it'll be okay for a while. In Calgary, the weather is bone dry, and there's no salt. And I'll be there this summer. Yes, looking forward to it. Okay, great. Great. John, can you, uh, this is Paul Campton, can you clarify the motor oil we should use? I know it should be 2050. How do I know that motor oil has high zinc content 
Oh, just same reason. The same reason the advertisers have discovered um, if there's any uh, any wheat in the product, gluten free. Um, it says it all all over usually. So I use um, my my go to oil. I used to use we used to use Castrol all the time, made by the Burma Castrol Corporation, Hackensack, New Jersey, that they were bought out by um, British Petroleum. And then they dropped the ZDDP, and now they've got something like Castrol Classic, something like that. And it's got 1,200 parts per million of ZDDP. But I use Valvoline VR1 right off the shelf at Napa. It's got the stuff in it, you know, it's, it, and it's 2050. In the gearbox, you don't have to use high zinc, just a waste of money putting high zinc um, oil in the gearbox. John Esposito at Quantum Mechanics says, oh my God, use 30 weight non-detergent. Don't use anything else. Workshop manual says 2050. We always use 2050. Now, not in the midget 1500 and not in the T-types. That takes 90 weight gear oil, 80, 90 gear oil. And for that matter, on a 1275 midget with a noisy gearbox, 1275 is quiet, or uh, 80, 90 in a 1275 box quiets it down a little bit. Out of the gearbox, we've drained red automatic transmission fluid, engine oil, and 90 weight. And it they, doesn't seem to make any difference what's in there. Any oil is better than no oil. But the best oil is either 2050 or straight 30 in the gearbox. 8090 in the in the uh, differential, 8090 in the in the uh, rack and pinion, and 8090 in the carburetors. John, Michael, Michael here. Uh, I just switched uh, my oil to that uh, Redline MTL manual transmission loop, and it did make a difference. I always had trouble getting into second gear on the downshift, and uh, that problem pretty much went away with the MTL. Uh, not sure why, uh, but even when I put it in, and originally it didn't seem to make any difference, but after it sat for a month and I used it a few times, it makes it uh, easier to shift. Okay, okay. MTL. What's it? What is that? The trade name of the stuff? Well, it's just Redline. Redline, Redline. Manual Redline. Transmission Redline. Lube. That's what it it is. And uh, okay. I was, you know, Barney says it doesn't really. He didn't notice any difference, but I did on my uh, transmission. It's just much easier to downshift into second for sure. Okay. All right. And that you're using what? What year model do you have? I've got a. a 57 MGA with a 1622 engine. Okay, and you're using you're so you're using a um like a 2050 gear gear oil in there or 90 weight or do you know or I, I don't know what the I don't okay. remember what the viscosity is. It's just MTL and I put it in the uh, okay. uh just out of the bottle. It's expensive. It's like 25 bucks a quart, which is real expensive. But well, what it, yeah, it is because you need two two quarts in that gearbox. Yeah, yeah. and it, but you know. If it works, it's worth it. If it I've works. used that stuff on all sorts of different cars. It works beautifully. Redline. Okay. Redline MTL, it's $75.90. Okay. John, did you John. mention uh, how often uh, you should bleed or flush your brake system? Annually. Yep. Should. Good. We just did that. Yeah, you know, just because it, 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 no matter what you got in there, it absorbs water. The the uh, the ten dollar word is uh, brake fluid is hydroscopic, right? And it it, it get it, it'll get in through the rubber lines. I mean, it, it it's I don't know. Go figure how that all works. But in if you leave the brakes just sit and not do anything, the water collects at the bottom and then rusts, and you get a lot of pitting. You see that in the master cylinders a lot. So if you if you do that, it doesn't matter what kind of fluid you're using. Um, silicone apparently absorbs less water, but it's still I mean it's still a pollutant. So it just makes sense to to do it. But I never I I we we used to do you, you didn't notice in the loop because I was going through so much of it so fast. You do not bleed the clutch. We used to bleed the clutches. Of course you'd bleed the clutch, right? And then like a month later, the guy would come back and say, oh, my clutch isn't working. That happened too many times. So we just leave, we just leave the, just left the clutch alone.
what, 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 what method do you like to use to bleed the brakes? Two people. So, for, two people. For, two people. It, it just, you know, there's almost always somebody else there. Open the bleeder, down with the pedal, close the bleeder, up with the pedal, wait a couple of seconds. Open, down, close, up. If you, if you hammer it, pump it up um, with normal fluid, and it doesn't cause too many problems with, with, with silicone fluid. Oh my gosh, you aerate it. It gets a billion little bubbles in it, and you gotta wait till tomorrow to continue bleeding. Really frustrating. So. Hey, John. So, Crystal. Yeah, question on uh, on that, right? I thought the manual said on the, the newer cars, they, they got that brake pressure um, device in the middle there. And it yes. says that you're supposed to unscrew that switch out a couple turns so the damper can go back and forth easily. Only only if it only if by bleeding it you've you've tripped it. If uh, you if you've tripped it, then yes. So um that's 68 through 80, um, 70, um, 75 through 80, it's in the bottom of the master cylinder. But if that piston shifts, then, then your, your red warning light on the dash illuminates. It says brakes to let you know that something's wrong. <clears throat> yeah, so you unscrew it a couple of turns, jump on the brakes, pump, pump, pump a couple of times, and that shuttle valve will centralize itself and then you put the screw that back in. And that's, people think that that's a, a pressure switch, but it's not. Some cars do have a Schrader valve. Schrader valve in it, Austin Americas do. It cuts the pressure to the rear brakes. That's not what this does. All it is is a shuttle valve. You got, you got fluid coming in. Um, on either end of the piston, fluid going out, straight through. But if there's if there's more pressure in the front or rear circuit, it'll push the, the piston fore or aft and that red light will come on. But when it shifts out yeah. forward or aft, it still sends brake fluid to the front and the back? Yes. yes. Okay, yes. thank you. John, can I you- I built lots of those, yeah, John. Yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure that the first time I took my TD to get it serviced, they uh, pumped the uh, rack and pinion full of grease. I'm real sure of that. I've been driving it for 12 years since then, uh, and the steering is stiff as can be. Um, can I just dilute that with? Um, so pull, so the, pull the rack boots off, slide them down the tie rods, crank it, you know, just full left get a rag, wipe the grease off the rack, full right, wipe the grease off the rack, full left, wipe the grease off the rack. And you do that until you're sick of wiping the grease off the rack. And at that point, you go up underneath there, it's a real huge nut. Um, it's like 9 16 BSF, maybe even 5 8 BSF, great big wrench. And you can just barely crack the thing loose and undo it because it's right beneath the radiator. It's a real bugger to, to reach. And then put some kind of filler nozzle up there and ooze 80, 90 in there. Well, you, of course, this after you got the, the rack boots back in place and just move it. You know, I, the easiest way is to have someone sitting in the car, spin in the wheel, two and a half turns, lock to lock, you know, and back and forth and back and forth. You're drooling the oil in. And finally, you get to a point where when they get it all the, all the way to one side, left lock or right, right lock, um, out comes a whole bunch of oil. And you go, well, I, I mean, you could spend all day and fill those boots all the way up. You don't want to do that. You just want to have oil inside of there. So. Okay. Yeah. Take, that take, the, take that nut off as opposed to using the... Zerk fitting to put the oil in. You can try to use a zerk. You can. You, I, I think Moss had a had an oiler available, um, but you talk about a mess. That's what I was afraid of. Okay, it's just a mess. So I mean, this is the way I'm describing it is is kind of a mess, but um, but it's not under pressure, 
right? It's just okay. drooling, <laughs> just drooling on the floor. The, the other the other way, you've got a you got some sort of screw device on the back to screw the oil in, and you don't know how much you're putting in. And so that's what it's there for, though. So now the reason that your steering is tight is either because the left kingpin is tight, the right kingpin is tight, the rack and pinion is tight. The rack and pinion is on a severe angle with the steering, the, the steering clover leaf. You're talking about the TD, right? Yeah, the one behind me. Yeah, okay. Um, and once in a blue moon, the um, the felt bushings in the on the steering column have swollen up and, and it's real hard to turn it, but you don't know what's causing it until you separate a couple things from each other. And you can you can separate the tie rod ends from the steering arms real easily. Um, not using a pickle fork, that just wrecks the, the boots, how you can buy new boots. But that um, I've got a YouTube video of just using a great big hammer. <laughs> great big hammer. They'll pop right off. So well, I'm gonna give that a try because uh, I mean I, I sort of thought maybe after a while the grease would um, give up, but it doesn't seem to be. Uh, I'm not used to it, but when I drive my friend's TD, it's like he's got power steering. Okay. When you go around the corner and let your you let your hands off the wheel, it should it should come right back and track straight. If you've got to walk it back, it's way too tight. No, it comes back. It comes back and. Yeah. and all of my driving is is around tight corners up in the mountains. In fact, we did about 75 miles this afternoon. Oh my, well, good for you. I have yet to get my, my MGA out, but it was just, it just hit almost 70 year today. And this is the first time since, I don't know, November, something that it's it's gotten this warm. This weekend, maybe I'll, maybe I'll, I'll get my A out. We got yeah. any more questions on um, the... Some people say it's a first robin. Some people say it's the first red wing blackbird. But I say it's when my MG gets on the road. That's the first sign of spring. And I think you probably feel the same way. Yep. Do we have any more questions about the lube? So you can download that form off the off the uh, off my website and use uh -huh. it. You don't have to do it all at one time. Um, you know, it's like a tune-up. You don't have to do it all in one afternoon. You can spread it out over weeks, but nicer if you do it. And there's some parts of it that that I used to have it organized on the on the printed form. It said with another person, and all that stuff was condensed, so you didn't have to go back after half an hour and holler to your spouse, your your SO, your your kid, you know, whoever, and say, hey, can you come out again? Anyway. John. Yes. One, one other question, John, on a late model B. Um, I've looked up under my recent purchase of this 1980, and uh, I can tell on the right rear, it looks it, there's lube on the outside of that shock. Is there a how how do I get to the access point? Is there something in in the behind car? behind the seats? Right at the outboard side of that shelf are two white discs, larger than a silver dollar, not much bigger than, than that. Put a screwdriver underneath those, pop them out of the, you'll see them, just get the carpet out of the way. And um, it's on that relatively horizontal shelf back there. One's just to the side of the battery compartment. The other one's in the exact same spot, but on the other side. Just pop those out with a screwdriver. And then underneath- Both Take both of them out. Underneath there, there's a, a 5 16 British bolt, but a 13 millimeter socket will fit it perfectly. Blow it off, brush it off a little bit because you don't want the, all the dirt that's collected on top of it to fall inside that hole. And then and then fill it up with, with uh, um, shock oil or, uh, or motorcycle fork oil. Is a leak bad there? You know, the rears can leak for a long time and they don't go bad easily. The fronts, if they leak, they're they're toast right away. But the the leak, the, the rears can leak for a long time. You really don't know how much it's leaking until you go to fill it back up and see. And as long as it's working, you know. 
Okay. It's just another drip. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. John. Yes. I want I wanted to add a comment regarding your checking light bulbs and lights. Yes. I'm in Wisconsin where beer is a way of life. And uh, one of the things I learned when I got picked up for drunk driving 50 years ago was the fact that that's the first thing cops look for when they're uh, looking for people or checking people is light bulbs out, be yeah. it a license plate light or a turn signal, whatever. So that's my two cents. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's um, it's just, and you'd never, I mean, you'd never know. That that was our old joke, you know, a customer would come in and say, I don't have any brake lights, you know, they, maybe the switch went bad. And I said, well, the bulbs are probably burned out. And, and they'd say, well, they, they both burned out at once. And I said, no, one of them's been out for, you know, a year and a half. You know, how would you know? It wasn't until the second one went out that the, uh, that the, that the guy coming up behind you passed you by and gave you the Hawaiian love sign. So, all right, we're going to go over to the chat section unless somebody, unless anybody else has got any more comments about the complete loop. All right, here we go. Tony Caputo, in the process of changing my bottom end bearings and oil pump on my 76 midget I'm using plenty of assembly lube, what is the method to, to Prime the engine and the oil pump to avoid a, tr a dry start. So the the way that we did it at the shop was to take the spark plugs out so the engine spins over briskly and just hit the starter ring, until until you get oil pressure. That was it. So is that a dry start? Yes, sort of. But it, you're not starting it. You're just a dry spin. There's no way to put a drill down in there and spin it like some other engines, apparently. There are devices you can buy that will pressurize the whole oil system, but it, is, it just isn't necessary. If, if you got plenty of lube on there, um, it'll stay there. You're not going to wear it off. Um, spinning it the 20 or 30 seconds it takes to get the oil pressure gauge to, to bump. Um, um, what year, Tony? What what year is your is your midget? It's a it's a seventy six, John. Okay. And one so of the, I read one thing about people say maybe you should fill the oil uh, pump with Vaseline to help help it start mm -hmm. to draw. Have you yeah. heard anything about that? I wouldn't. I wouldn't fill it. I you know oil it. Put some oil in it. We wipe it. <laughs> I'm I'm the I'm the red red grease uh, I'm the red grease god I you know I pack I don't pack, I wouldn't pack it with grease but I put put it on the on the uh, rotor in the vein um, just so that when it starts spinning it'll create enough of a vacuum to to get the oil up in there. Okay. You can pre lube that Triumph engine. Just look online. You'll find lots of stuff. Okay. All right, I'll look for that because I was trying to figure out how to do it. I was just afraid of dry starting. Yep, fair enough. Yeah, starting the engine, starting the engine without oil pressure is dangerous because what happens if you're not going to get oil pressure? When do you turn it back off again? And there's you know there's all those forces going on. So yeah. you take the spark plugs out and you're going to spin it like that so it's got no load on it. Right. So it spins spins quickly, brisk briskly. Yep. And there's no chance of it starting, no. Yeah. So our next one up here is Marty, my administrative assistant, who's who's got to save the date on here, and that's for the University Motors Summer Party Reunion uh, in 2023. It's um, uh, August 18th and uh, 19th um, in Grand Rapids. If you if you ever came to a University Motors Summer Party, this won't be like the big MG summer parties we used to have where we had 550 MGs on the field and 50 more in the parking lot who wouldn't pay the 25 bucks to come on the field. Um, it won't be like that. This is a reunion. So we're not going to have voting and we're not going to have a lot of stuff we used to have, but it's a chance to see each other's cars and see each other. You know, it's a social event, but that's coming up in, in August. 
So we'll have a registration form pr pretty soon. And uh, Marty's also got a direct link to the PayPal. Thank you. Marty's got another note, and, um, and that's uh, PDFs. Um, those, uh, the, as I said, the, the complete lube is a printable PDF, even though I should go in and make a couple of changes. And the only one I have up is for the MGP. Um, I did create complete lubes for T types and A's and midgets and midget 1500s. That's where that 15 hose clamp thing comes from. Um, but um, we almost always use the MGB form for everything for all, all the rest of the cars. Uh, Pat G is John on Venmo. I am, I guess, because my daughter pays me on Venmo, but I don't know how to get there. Um, you can um, send me an email, Pat, and and um, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll make sure it works huh, for you. Uh, it's, prob it's probably at my email address. That's, that's what most of them use. Um, um, oh, here, here we go. Marty says, well, not yet, but we, you, can, you can use um, anything on, on PayPal, but I do have a Venmo account. So let's see, Rob Brackett, who can true a steel wheel? in Grand Rapids. Rob, are you on? Rob Brackett, he's got a bug eye sprite. One of, the, one of the saddest, one of the saddest things I saw that was that last year, two two years ago, the whole front corner of the bug eye sprite yeah. on it was just just all smashed up. But he found a guy here in town in Grand Rapids with another uh complete bonnet. It was just it was going to be thousands of dollars to fix the original one. Um, I don't know any, anyone who can true a steel wheel. I had my wheels, 15 inch wheels on my MGA re-rimmed by Diamond Wheel in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I don't know if they'll do, I don't know if they can do 13 inch rims, no idea. But that, that was the solution. I was, I'm so pleased with the job that Diamond Wheel did. Out of so, so John, talk uh, about every, that. Uh, everybody were talked. your wheels out of true? Oh, Rob Rackett's on now. Okay. Uh, at least at least yeah. at least is um, um my wheels, it wasn't just the lip. People say, oh I, I can I can straighten the wire wheel and then they they bend the lip. No, no, this this thing was uh, somebody that had put before sometime before I bought my MGA in 1976, somebody had, had you know had the wheels had the tires changed. And remember, those old tire changers were just brutal, brutal pieces of of fierce equipment. Now they all come out and they they gently grab the inside of the wheel, you know, and and it's just so and it's it's very gentle. But those old ones were just awful, and I'm sure that's what happened is that somebody took it and, and um, wrench these tires off and in so doing actually bent the wheel so that so that the, the wheel was doing this you know going down the road and um, uh, Rob you got disc wheels there was got to be more midget disc wheels around but you might you might contact diamond wheel and see if, if he can do a 13 inch it cost me a thousand bucks for all all five wheels on my MGA that was a couple years ago before COVID. And I, I thought it was a deal. I just, uh, because I fought it for 25, 30 years, um, maybe longer, I guess, uh, 40 years on my MGA. And it was just, I couldn't drive it over about 70. And now I can drive it at 100. <laughs> so it's so smooth. Yeah. Maybe Dor Johnson's got some more together. wheels. <laughs> I did actually find three other wheels, but I've got a few of them to get back where they uh, spun them. And everybody I've asked says, oh, yeah, well, every sort of a shop is a straight wheel. So they're all effective. But now those those machines seem to be something in the past. It's not something in the past. There's all kinds of guys that'll come out to your house in true an aluminum rim on your, on your, uh, on your minivan. But they they won't do steel wheels, and I, I looked and look, I mean I looked for twenty years, Rob, 
and I, I that's when I found this place to re rim them. Did they put uh, 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 tubeless tire rims on? Well, yes. The, the, the nicest thing about my wheels were that there's not a safety lip because uh, because in, in 1962 uh, you, you were running a tube inside the tire. So there wasn't a safety lip, but the new rims have got a safety lip on them. But you look at the old rims and the new rims, you can't. I've got, I got a deluxe, so it looks like a twin cam wheel. You can't. I mean, somebody who's really, really knowledgeable could come down and look at it, but chances are no one would ever, ever see it. And it's a slight, a slight increase in the safety. So all the way. I'd called, I'd called Hendrix because they did my wire wheels on the B and I wanted them to do the steel wheels on the TD. And they said, we can't do it. We don't know anybody that can do it. Do you have any idea? I've got like 70,000 on the um, uh, uh, dial indicator. Right. Of, is there a standard of like, it should be under X? I don't know. Send them the diamond wheel. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Diamond wheel in Milwaukee. Diamond wheel, Milwaukee. They, I got 15 inch rims on my MGA, so it's the same. It's the same wheel. So, I mean, it's it's not not I got five holes. You got four holes. The rim, yeah. I, I, I don't even have holes. I got pegs, but yeah, yeah. But they, they. I'm sure. Well, I'm, I'm not sure they can do it. But boy, that's the only place I've ever found. I didn't so. mean to steal Rob's uh, question, but I've really been fighting this for about two years. Yeah. Really, I mean that's it, and you only have to have two of them in the front. In the rear, you you, you, you don't feel this in the rear. Um, you see it in the rear view mirror. Rear view mirror will shake um, when you're going down the road, same as it does if the drive shaft isn't in balance. Um, but it's not as noticeable as the steering wheel. Just you know, you can't hang on to it. All right, Greg Fowler, would you say a complete lube needs to be done? in a shop on a ramp, or could it be a do-it-yourself job on jack stands? Uh, printing my forms now, and we'll hand off to my service guy if necessary. Um, it's so much easier to do it on a hoist. I didn't have a hoist in my shop until 1985. Um, my line was um, real men, uh, real men don't, uh, real men use jack stands. But then I was visiting Glenn Lenhard in Florida in 1985, and he said, you're crazy. <laughs> Get a hoist. And I think within, I don't know, maybe three months, we had two hoists in the shop. Once we got one, it was like, oh, my gosh, this, is, this makes it so much easier. So, yeah, you can do it on the floor, but it's just up and down and up and down. So. Let's see. Um, Nathaniel Salzman, oh, he says, Craig, yes, you can do it in your in, in jack stands in your garage. So apparently he's he he has. Um, so Pat G from California um, says asbestos is still present in some brake shoes. It was never outlawed. Okay, so when you go to sand your brake shoes and sand the inside of your drums, don't inhale the particulates. So everyone's got masks. Everyone's got a thousand masks that the government sent us. So you can use those, those, those masks. And, um, oh, who's the guy from Ohio? The red hair guy. Um, uh, he died from uh, mesothelioma. And I, last time I saw him, he goes, yeah. He said, you know, when I worked at the dealership, we take Eric the Jones. Eric, Eric Jones. Eric Jones, thank you. Thanks, Sid. Um, yeah, Eric said, you know, must have been that. They'd take a blow gun and blow all the all the asbestos out of there. And I mean, some people breathe asbestos all their lives and they don't get it. And some people spent two months on a summer job working at Monsanto and and died 30 years later. It it affects everybody differently, but but uh, yeah, don't breathe. Don't breathe the fumes from the from the past. Where did Only I takes one fiber to kill you. Really? 
But the good news is the asbestos in brake dust is ground up very fine. So it's not as dangerous as the stuff you would encounter in construction or shipbuilding. Okay. Right? It's still dangerous though, bad stuff. So nowhere on here, on my complete lube list, how did this get missed? But we take the pads, take a piece of 100 grit sandpaper, just put it on the floor and rub the pad on it to take the glaze off it. And then before you put the brake pad back in, we always put duct tape on the back of the pads. Now you can buy all kinds of anti-squeal stuff now. And if you buy the, the pads from, oh, why can I never remember those pads, the, the ones that, Bob and Gloria Cook. Gloria Saint. <laughs> Girl you know, asked from AutoZone. <laughs> yeah, Girl asked from AutoZone. I, I got to get that to roll off my lips. Um, but we always put a, a chunk of duct tape on the back of the pad, clean the back of the pad off, put the duct tape on it, and then trim it so it doesn't fold around the edges and start to screw up the, the free movement of the pad. Um, but that, that, would, that would help in, in reducing. So. Let's see, most manufacturers of brake parts stopped using it, but some imports still have asbestos, probably from our favorite country, yeah. All right, here we go from, uh, this is Grand Pow. Everybody, in regard to a battery cutoff switch, where would you mount it and what type should you buy? I think we talked about this last time because there were a lot of people had comments about it. I put one in my daughter's MGB GT. I put it um, just behind the passenger seat on the, on the um, are you online, Grand Pal? I put it um, on, that, on that angle section just behind the seat. And so you have to reach behind the passenger seat with a key, with a red key. I bought it for, I'm sure I bought it for Moss. And, um, and, and switch it on and off, and then you keep the keys someplace. And I, and I put a disconnect on the positive side of the battery. Um, so you could do it on the negative side just as well, um, but that's a pretty handy place to put that on, a, on an M MGB, because you can reach it pretty easily. So. What, what about the, the wattage, the, the gauge of the wire and um... Well, if you, just, use for that. if you use the original battery clamps um, and the original battery wire, then there, there isn't going to be a, a problem. You can go to NAP and buy just a battery clamp, always or a, a, a wire, you know, 12 inch wire uh, to go, you know, with a clamp on it and a wire to go down to, to the switch. And then what did I do on my daughter's? I bet I bought an end and I sod, I cleaned the wire, put the end on it. And then, and then uh, heat it up with a propane torch and just filled the thing with solder, crimped it and soldered it, um, and then put shrink tubing on it or rapid PVC tape, something or other. Um, but any, any um, cable that you buy from Napa will be okay, battery cable. Just don't buy a red one, um, just buy a black one. Um, they're, they're, well, a red one on a positive post isn't a real problem, but a red one on a negative post. Oh my gosh, we used to we used to re, replace alternators every springtime. Uh, people would say, oh, you know, I, I went to put my battery back in and I forgot I had a red cable on it. And so I hooked it up, you know, red to positive, of course, and they'd let the smoke out of the alternator. So in, in the car would come and we'd have to replace it. So but I it just, you can buy that. And it's some kind of it's a long length, six foot of battery cable if you had to change the whole thing. But I don't, I don't know why you'd have to change the whole thing. It's as big around as your little finger. I don't know what gauge it is. I have a clue. Two, I don't know. Oh, what about uh, using an old set of jumper cables, just chopping it up and using that? To go from where to where? To go from the battery to- uh, Just the red wire going from the battery, using the, uh, not the ground, using the, the um, positive side. Well, you, you could do that, but you, you got to put ends on it. I mean, you can put a battery end on it. That's easy, but you've got to, you've got to go, um, um, you've got to have some kind of lug to go underneath yeah. the nut. So you're just better to go to Napa and spend 12 bucks on a battery cable. Hey, John, oh, okay. Napa, Napa has a 12 and a 14 inch cable with the lugs already on it. 
Yeah, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's it's eight, ten bucks. It's not, it's not even expensive. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. I sure recommend that. I have a had an under dash fire this weekend on my sixty three B, and I flipped that switch off just like where John said he put his on his daughter's car, and it saved a major problem. Oh my gosh, that's so sad when that happens. Get your first your first reaction is to grab a hold of the wiring and just pull it, right? <laughs> to, to cause a massive disconnect. But that what it's like grabbing. <laughs> It's like grabbing hold of a red hot wire. <laughs> it is grabbing hold of a red hot wire. Oh the my wire God. overdrive switch was completely bare when I got it home. <laughs> you are Not so that long of a bare wire. <laughs> and that was on the overdrive wire. Yeah, it comes off the ignition side and the white wire over to the overdrive. And it's not burned past the switch. So I, I don't know what it is. Maybe a faulty ignition switch. I haven't got it apart yet. <laughs> Well, you're you're really fortunate. That's yeah. That. Yep. Oh my gosh. That's why I always always tell people to put a fuse in their overdrive circuit. Um, it is unfused from the ignition switch to the switch, and unfused from the switch to underneath the bonnet. But but on a on a seventy seven through eighty MGB that continues fished all through a couple loops and clips and stuff, and I I. I asked a guy one time who was trying to get his fire out, you know, and, and it was just that a, a, a five dollar inline fuse from Napa would have would have solved it, you know, prevented it, prevented it. So I have one on the high high power side going to the solenoid. I just didn't put one on the dash in the dash. Yep. I will now <laughs> once I sort it out. <laughs> but that okay. switch, I can't say enough to put a battery cutoff switch back there. Okay. All right. Well, the proof is in the pudding. So yeah, there, there you go. Hey, John. Yes. Yes. That. yes. Yeah. I, I went ahead and installed my battery cutoff switch, and I bought the number two AWG uh, gauge black cable with three eighths inch lug nut lugs on the end. Okay. Available on Amazon. All right. So you okay. can get those on Amazon. Um. The one thing I wanted to kind of point out for people, don't make the same mistake I made, was I went to put the uh, switch in behind the past the driver's seat, okay? And I went ahead and measured the size of the, the, the back part of the switch, and I drilled a hole. In other words, a round hole. It's not supposed to be a round hole. It's an oblong hole on some of those switches that stops the switch from rotating when you turn it. So basically trick to that is drill the hole smaller and then use your uh, file or grinder and just grind the, the sides of that so it doesn't turn. I don't know if it's making any sense, everybody. Yeah, but I understand what you mean. Yep. Yep. Or, or read the instructions first. <laughs> <laughs> Don't need no stinking instructions. When, uh, when I was putting when I was putting together my daughter's seventy three BGT, uh, she she ordered some products herself, and uh, I was just so impressed. She'd get them and she completely read the instructions completely. And I was just so impressed because it's you know it's not a guy uh, it's not a guy thing to do to read instructions because we're supposed to know how all that stuff works. But she did and and. Uh, uh, especially with her interior, she painted the uh, headliner in her GT, and it's just beautiful. I mean, it's just, you think it was brand new. It's just, it worked out really, really well. Painted a lot of the interior panels, too. So, John, do you have a cutoff in your uh, MGA twin cam or your uh, 1622 Deluxe? Nope. I can't think of where to put it. I've got a cutoff in the TD, but it's under the bonnet. A lot of good that does me. Well, um, you know, again, you put it if you put it behind the passenger seat, passenger seats, you know, gonna run into it. And um, I mean it would go in the same place. You still got that angled piece, you know, behind there's the seat. No space back there. But there's yeah, you're and you can't put it in the battery cover because then uh, you can't get the battery cover off, you know. Um, no, I I don't I don't have one. I should I probably should. First time I have a, a fire that I I that creeps me out, I'll probably end up buying one or something. 
Uh, let's see, Craig Fowler, is there any way to improve the recoil of the seat belts? So Craig, are you online? Wait for a moment here for Craig to unmute himself. If he yes, can. yes, John, I'm online. All right, what year do you have? 74. No, <laughs> no, you can't. Um, no, you have to buy new ones. I, I used, I, I have, attempted the repair of every part in the car. Um, switches, I mean, you name it. I, I've tried to repair stuff and, and, you know, and then, then made a judgment. Does it make sense to do this or not? And um, I, if you take that cover off, it says do not remove, and it goes, <laughs> it's a main, you know, it's a mainspring. Right. And, uh, it's coiled up from here to Toledo. And I'm in Grand Rapids, so it's it's a it's a it's a long, 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 and you just can't. I don't, you know, I don't know how they did it in the factory setting, but no, no, you can okay. spread stuff on it. But I love fixed seat belts. Now, if you and someone else are sharing the driving of the car, and that other person is not your size, and that the seat has to come forward, or there's a dramatic change in the in the belt. Um, you can make a case that that a fixed seat belt is is cumbersome, um, but man, for driving, you know, you cinch yourself in with a. That's what I got my MGA in a cinched seat belt. And I just lock myself in, and I my body becomes one with the vehicle, and then my my arms and my legs are able to to do all the you know the clutch and the throttle and the steering and the shifting and. I never have to hold myself in position with the steering wheel or anything. It's uh, it's really nice, but I'm the only one who drives my car, <laughs> too. You know, so and I and then modern modern seat belts are are pretty expensive, but you want nice seat belts. So fixed seat belts are still real cheap, but hey, the, the recoils are a lot more. Yes. There's a place up in uh, North Texas that restores seat belts. I had mine for uh, my car restored. Uh, and they also do, from what I understand, the uh, that tensioner. Okay. I, come, I, I put the link over there in the chat. Uh, they're, snake, they're called snake oil uh, restorations, but it's not spelled like snake oil. Okay. All right. It's on the right-hand side. Okay, so it's in the chat section. Thank you, Crystal. Thanks very much. That's it's always nice to find somebody that you know that's that's figured this stuff out. Um, that's that's nice. Kangol had a recall on those seat belts for years until everybody went broke. I think till maybe 1985, we could still send seat belts in and get a new set, but that's long long since uh, long since expired. Now, Craig, Keep in mind, if you send it to them, it took me three months to get them back. Okay. It takes a while. They are really backed up. Okay. Okay. Craig Fowler, um, my brake lights sometimes stay on. I uh, think it's the alignment issue with the pedal arm and the switch. How do you make an adjustment? Craig, what, what year and model do you have? Seven, 74, John. B. Yeah, 74B. All right. So you take the pedal box cover off, mm -hmm. and the pedal should be right, I mean, right in front of the switch, immediately in front of the switch. If it's shifted side to side, it's because it's somebody's taken the pedals out and put it back in incorrectly. So you okay. got pedals on each side, and then a big mm -hmm. washer, and then a distance piece in, in between. And okay. Of course, a bolt runs all the way through it, and you can you can fiddle. It's a terror to do because <laughs> you're up above, and and as soon as you get stuff just in place and start to move the bolt, the washer drops on the floor, and then you have to stop, and you got to go inside the car and get the washer back. It's it it can be tedious, huh. but that's the way that it, it's supposed to be, and it's right right in front. I can't imagine another reason why the lights would stay on. Um, except for that alignment issue, unless the switch is bad. 
right? No, that's what I figure it is. And I can't blame anybody else but me because I was the one that did it. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Good thing. Good thing I didn't say anything. Yeah. Yeah. It's easy to get it all, all confused, you know. So. Yep. All right. Caleb. Caleb Witt. Caleb, are you on? You can you can unmute yourself and come on. Tell us where you're from. I'm here in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. All right. Had no reverse lights on my 72B. Changed the switch on the transmission, and now they're always on. Swap the wires or something else. Something else. Um, the the, uh, the switch has got a plunger in it, and when you push this, the, the plunger up, it makes contact. So the original switches had, they had these orange, thick cardboard kind of washers, and they were selectively fitted. The problem is your switch is turned in too far. So if you can get a washer to, to go around, that's a 14 millimeter thread, 14 by 2.0 metric thread, go figure, um, on that switch. So you need a, a, a washer, you know, that's the size of a half a dollar with a with a hole in it. And it can be, you can go to the hardware store and find something that'll fit in there. And you just have to fiddle with it so that, yes, they do come on when you put it in reverse, but no, they don't stay on all the time. So it's just getting the, the getting the height of that switch correct. Gotcha. I appreciate it. I, um, I, I wasn't sure if it was just a swap wire like I was saying or something else but I haven't I just disconnected them all together and just haven't been using them <laughs> so you, you, can't, you can't drive around with them on well you can in the daytime but not not, not it's like so disconcerting you know sure yeah well I appreciate it John you're welcome one of the most common reasons that they don't work is because um not your problem but um that they don't work is something's been bounced around in the in the in the trunk in the boot, and it's knocked the wires off the bottom of the of the uh, re reverse lights. That's that's why you in that complete loop you're checking the reverse lights. So you go, oh, one of them's not not on, you know, and so you open up the trunk and you reach in there and there's the plug just dangling. Anyway, real common. All right, Craig Fowler, we're back to Craig. I worked out, uh, worked in my dad's garage. A customer came in for a gas fill-up. I asked him if he'd like his oil checked. He responded that his oil light was not on, so it probably wasn't necessary. Okay, all right. Um, I said, what if the brake light bulb was blown? I checked his oil, and it took three liters uh, before it registered on the dipstick. Yeah, well, you know... Um, if he had an oil pressure gauge and he was watching the pressure, he would have seen that that pressure wasn't hot. It wasn't as high as it was supposed to be. But people have got all kinds of all kinds of stories, you know. Yep, yep. Now I don't want to waste any any money on oil. Okay, <laughs> waste it on an engine instead. You know, so our our our, uh, our our engines don't have kidneys. All they've got is a filter. You know, that's it. So, um, boy, it's keeping enough oil and fresh oil in the engine is, is the only thing you can do to assure that you get the longevity. Um, all right, so Linda to everybody, sorry got on late. What engine oil did he recommend? Maybe he is me. Um, and I recommend uh, 20W50, high zinc, which means 1300 parts per million. And we have the, the my go-to oil is always Valvoline VR1 in it at Napa. And it comes with 12, 1300 parts per million. There's AMS oil's got it. Um, uh, Castrol has some sort of classic oil. Uh, sometimes it's harder to get. I, I just wherever you can find it, but it's got to have that high zinc. So. You don't need that in the gearbox. You don't need the high zinc. Uh-oh, Pat's caught me on something here. John, I think you misspoke. That's a kind way of saying it. The valve that, um, that reduces pressure to the rear brakes is a proportioning valve. You said Schrader. Yes, I did say Schrader. Um, but, and I think that's what you use to fill up a tire, right? So, um, yes, it's a proportioning valve. Correct. But they are on Austin Americas. I know that. Minis, too, I think. So, 
Greg Fowler again. John, I've been told I need to replace both kingpin stub axle assemblies on my 74B Roadster. Uh, getting parts in Newfoundland is a challenge. Therefore, I want to make my parts order complete on the first order. What exactly will I need to replace while doing this job? I'm aware that getting a complete assembly is the way to go to avoid, avoid the need for reaming. Yeah, well, first of all, if you're going to rebuild your own kingpins, you got to get the kingpins apart. And that's a, that's a struggle. I mean, that's just, that's how we see as a, a, the blue tip wrench. Turn the, turn the trunnions almost red hot and press them out on a, on a great big press. I mean, it's a bugger to get those things apart. So you want to buy somebody, a set that's already been set up. All you have to do is, is go for it. Um, you want to get A-arm bushings, and you want to get, um, and I, I like the red ones. Uh, the, um, there's black, there's red, and there's a original rubber. Don't ever buy the original ones. There's also V8 bushings. Those are those are okay. Those are rubber, but they've got a steel insert in them. Um, but um, if you wanted to give me a call uh, tomorrow, I, Craig, I, I, I'll be happy to, to just spend a little bit of time with you and, and, and tell you what to look for. There, there are a number of people in Canada that, that sell this stuff. And I think you can get stuff out of England pretty inexpensively. I mean, as compared to ordering it from, uh, for instance, Moss in the United States. I, I think that that import stuff goes pretty pretty easily. And there's a bunch of places in England, I'm sure, including MG Owners Club, that sell this kind of stuff that's rebuilt already. So, Yeah, Moss, uh, I think, bought one of the Canadian companies that I used to go through. Uh, okay. So they're not available anymore. And it's the shipping and the difference in the Canadian and U.S. dollar that yeah. really kills you. Well, you don't need to replace your kingpins. I mean, it's not a safety issue. The, the more worn they get, the, the tires start, they're not straight up up, up and down, right? The, 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 the tires are ever so slightly apart at the top. But over a period of time, they, they start to move, but they don't move much. And it'll never break off you, your steering would be better you know, handle better all that kind of stuff but it's not it's not a safety issue i can say that with some assurance having seen so many that are so horrible <laughs> but they've never yeah. broken not there you know so. i just get a lot of i'll get a lot of play in my steering wheel at higher speeds and that was the concern right well it could be that but let's talk about that just for a second so the steering wheel, 74, right? So it's a yep. collapsible steering column. So the wheel can be loose to the inner shaft. The inner shaft can be, can be loose to the other inner shaft. And the only way you can find out is to have your associate move the steering wheel that far, not, not that, just like that. And you feel down at the top of the steering U-joint and, and watch, watch him, is there, is there play between those two columns? There often is some, not much you can do about it. You can take it out and drill it and pin it and stuff. And then, then there's the, the, um, the splines and the bolts that hold the steering U-joint to the, to the pinion and to the steering column and the steering U-joint itself. And then down on the, on, the, um, on the rack and pinion, then there's a whole bunch of shims down there to... Okay. Um, that you can remove, but if you remove too many, it gets too tight. So it's like, duh, you know, it's like, you know, put some back in, but that's what the complete lubes are all about because there should be no rotational free play without the, without the wheels starting to move. And okay. um, I suppose if they're really bad, if it's a really worn, you might get some movement, but not much. So okay. it's something else. I'll check into it. Okay. Thanks. All right. Alan Thompson's uh, and Linda are back and forth on the VR1. Um, Craig Fowler's uh, all set here. Uh, thank you for the lube list, Henry Lefevre uh, in Calgary. Um, Marty's got some more stuff up on here. Uh, I phoned everybody. 
Is there any benefit to installing an auxiliary oil line for the rocker assembly on a 76 midget? I don't know. I'm not as familiar with that engine as I am with all the others. Um, and I want to say, doesn't the oil come off the front cam bearing? Or does it come off the rear cam bearing? It comes off the rear cam bearing. Um, I don't know why you'd want to install an extra oil line up there for the rocker assembly. But if you take the, the valve cover off and start the car up, watch all the rockers shaking and, and so forth, it should be dripping pretty freely. Um, if it's not, then, then you might make a case for another line or for cleaning out. Um, there's, a, there's a drilling that goes down through the, through the head and into the block. There's a bolt on the back of the head for a cross drilling. You could take that bolt out. It's got a copper washer underneath it, clean it one way or the other. Um, I, I, if there's not enough oil getting on the valve assembly, then it's not running down the push rods, it's not running onto the cam followers, and it's gonna, it's gonna eat up the camshaft. So you have to have oil up there. Oh. But I, I've never seen that auxiliary line before. Doug, on a 69 MGB GT with overdrive, what type of oil does the overdrive need? It's the same oil that's in the main gearbox. They share the sump. And again, that's 2050, or if you're following John Esposito's advice from quantum mechanics, straight 30 non-detergent. Uh, how much does it take? 69B, you gotta look, look it up. I mean, it's about three quarts, I think. Um, um, but there's a dipstick. <laughs> it's just such a task to get it in there. You got to reach behind the radio box and pull out a rubber bung that was last um, supple, you know, in 1973. So you, you got to rip that thing out, out of there, and then and then to get the dip get the dipstick out. That that doesn't want to come out. So you have to make fashion a hook out of a coat hanger, optional use for the coat hanger, and go through there and around your hand and pull up. And no matter how Carefully, you try to pull up, your hand all of a sudden comes up too fast, and then the screws that somebody put the console back in with it are too long and sharp on the end, open up your skin. Um, so when you get the dipstick out, it's got two O-rings on it uh, for sealing. Take the bottom one off. You don't need two. One's just fine. And uh, now it's open, and now you need a, 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 a snake uh, uh, filler. Um, and um, you want to you want to get a pretty good feel for how much oil is supposed to be in there. When you drain the gearbox, the overdrive doesn't completely drain. You can get the gearbox almost totally drained by taking off the rectangular filter underneath. But that's a lot of work. If you got a little bit of oil left in there, it'll probably be j just fine. So it, it's around two two quarts or so. Doug, thank you. It's not easy to install. I mean, you take the you take the take the slide the passenger seat back all the way, take the carpet out because you're going to spill the oil somehow, some way. You know, and you got that thing in there. And if you, if the oil's warm to start with, it's going to run down a little faster. It's just a bugger to do. We filled them from underneath. Um, we 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 had a, a hook um, uh, on a tube. You know, we, we had a power drum and you get to rrr, 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 and then bump the stuff in. And if you got a little too much in, you take the drain plug out and then quick put it back in. And and, and the, the distance, um, the distance between high and low on the on the gearbox dipstick, I think is a pint. So. Okay. All right. Thank you, John. Uh, yeah, I have a uh, zip tie I have tied around the um uh, the uh, to this the stick. So I have reached uh, that that can get that out okay. And uh, one other thing, uh, speaking of lights, I've gotten in the habit of every time I drive my cars, you know, once a week or once every 10 days, I check that the brake lights work and the turn signals work. I use it, I, I do it once a month. Uh, everything I would check once a month, but nowadays I'm checking 
the turn signal lights and the brake lights every time before I drive the car. Um, and I hope they don't go out while I'm driving. <laughs> uh, so, so anyway, that's what I do. All right, so Doug, Doug, Doug and I always have hat wars. What would your hat say to today? I can't, I can't read it. I can't, I can't type. Oh, it, it's a, it looks like golf. It's a ma the Masters, John, the Masters. Okay, all right. Okay. Well, I'm not a sports guy, but I brought, I brought my hat to go up against Doug. Mine says Federal Reserve Police. Okay, so. All right, thank you. All right, that, that's our that's our hat war tonight. Sean, I purchased uh, the Bill Hirsch gas tank sealer for my TC, but have not used it yet. I heard mixed reviews on the sealant failing over time. Do you or others uh, on this call have experience with this product? Sean, are you still on? You waited all this time to, to, to hear an answer. Or did you quit early? I am on, John. Hey, okay, there we go. Um, I'd be cautious. I just, who did I just talk to? I just talked to a guy uh, last week who would sealed his gas tank. I have no idea what he used. Don't know. But I know that the sealer that, that everybody is called slushing compound. Well, they use it in aircraft. I mean, what, what could be safer? You know, I mean, aircraft, it can't slough off the walls on an air, air, airliner tank. But it's going to fall out of the sky. But then they added alcohol to the gasoline, and it dissolved it dissolved the um, the the earlier style of sealant. So I don't know. I I don't know. And if you call them, of course, they're probably going to tell you, "Oh, we've never heard a complaint about it." Um, so maybe they're not the most trust. I mean, their goal is to sell the stuff. Uh, not the most trustworthy source. Do you really need it? Do you, I mean, is it that rusty on the inside? It's a mixture of varnish and uh, and there is rust. I, so I was thinking of just using the cleaning aspects of the product and just not putting the sealer in and just mm -hmm. it, it sat for 50 years in oh. a garage. Oh, <laughs> okay. So what, what, col what color is the car? British Racing Green. Okay, so that's hard to match because if you get the tank off the car, um, and and you can you can take it to a radiator shop if you can find one, and they'll put it into a tank, some kind of caustic soda, or I don't something or other, and then it'll come out beautifully clean on both sides. So you have to repaint it. Um, Boris Johnson, who took over my shop was crowing about electrolysis. So they put something down inside the tank, put a, I don't know, some kind of anode down inside there, an anode, cathode, down inside there and, and hooked it up to a battery for a couple of days. And it drew the rust, it drew the rust off the inside. Um, you can get compounds, you can get solvents that will help to reduce the, the varnish so it's not in chunk form. Um, and, um, and then finally, um, when you're all done doing that, you can, sounds horrible, you can either cut the supply line to the fuel pump um, or you can extend it one or the other with a, with a rubber line and put, and put a filter or two in, in parallel and just start driving the car and just see, can you, can you drive it for hundred miles without the filters plugging up? Can you drive it for, you know, three minutes and they plug up? I mean, that's, that's another issue too. But back to your original question, I don't know. I've only heard one recent complaint about some kind of gas tank sealant. Okay. Well, someone on the call was kind enough to respond privately and they, um, they're not so certain themselves uh, if it's the greatest idea. Um, just the fact that some people have experienced issues makes me want to be uh, err on the side of caution. And uh, what happens is if that stuff comes loose, then you get this. Well, it's it's like a it's like opening up a can of spar varnish a year later, you know. And there's a skim on the top of it, and um, you've got to get that all all out of there, or you can't use the spar varnish. 
like I tried to do on a floor about three days ago. I should have screened it first. Hey, John. Yeah. Um, on my mini estate wagon, the tank was really bad. And I took it to a professional. Once they, they actually had to cut it apart and it had been lined and it crystallized into giant chunks. And he gave me a box of just junk. I've had that on two gas tanks. My suggestion is if you have somebody who does radiators and, and gas tanks, they use something that's really, really good. The one that they, the two that they've done for me had a pink tint to it, uh, whatever the sealant was. Now, obviously they cut the bottom of the tank out, uh, but they sealed it with this stuff that's been awesome. I've not had any trouble with anything that they've done. I would suggest just using a professional to do it. I've, the two tanks I've had were both lined and there was just junk all through it. Just a whole box of stuff. Yeah, and the problem is you can't buy another TC fuel tank. I mean, or well, you can, but they, I'm not sure that they fit quite right. Um, and it's 1600 bucks or something, so. And another thing, uh, Bob Ash, who you've met here in Altoona, yeah. um, he devised this system where he fills the tank with vinegar and he hooked up fish tank pumps and runs vinegar through them for a couple of days. And it cleans it out. It's, okay. it's unbelievable. So really it's cleans real, it. Real slight acid. You could put in distilled water and a, and a splash of, of hydrochloric acid too, or something. Probably. Yeah, he just sets them outside and leaves them pumped for a day, two okay. days, a couple of days. Okay. And cleans it all out. Okay. Now I shook. I uh, put gravel and uh, the um, very dilute hydrochloric acid in mine, and just shook the heck out of it because you the mechanical got rid of the scaly rust and the hydrochloric acid got rid of the, the surface rust and got it clean and i did follow up with uh um some kind of red stuff and i haven't had a problem yet but that's only been about a year okay it's so frustrating when that stuff does slough off because it'll go right around the filter and then the fuel pump, of course, is trying to suck gasoline out of there and sucks the stuff tight around the filter. And the fuel pump gets really hot because it's trying to suck, <laughs> trying to suck gasoline out of there. And then, and then uh, if, the if the filter screen is, is perforated at all, it'll suck it down the tube that goes up to the, up to the pump. So now you're going to take an old Speedo cable and use it like a rotor router to clean out the, clean out the, the, uh, the brass, the brass line. Yeah, it's it's. Um, John, you're you're asking a good question here, but there, there, you haven't got a like a solid answer, but you got a fun, whole bunch of ideas here. So keep keep chasing it. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, keep the tank full and don't use ethanol, and you won't have any moisture and you won't get any rust. Agreed. And um, back to Rob with the bug eye sprite. Uh, steel wheel straightening, there's a place in Washington, New Hampshire um, um, that, well, their website's down, so maybe that's not a good, a good sign of whether they're actually, you know, doing a, doing a, a, a still doing a, a job. Um, Gil Dupre is weighed in here and said, they make a remote disconnect switch now. That's such a conflict in technology. What a yeah, something you press with your finger and it and it uh, you're gonna uh, disconnect until it until it doesn't work. Um, so let's see, Bob. To everybody, I do have a battery cutoff switch behind the passenger seat on my MGA. It's low profile. You cannot you cannot remove the key. Um, so that that must mean. Are you still on, Bob? About that um, must mean that you I am. in such a way that it came with a key, but you just can't get the key out. Well, no, it's the the way the switch is. The key, the the part you grab to turn doesn't come off in any way. It's mounted, so that's part of the low profile 
that keeps, and unfortunately I'm not with the car and I can't go to look at the manufacturer, but <laughs> there is one out there and it fits and I don't have any problem with it hitting with the back of the seat. So, so. It's, it's not a, it's not a, um, a theft device. It's not a theft device, Safety but it's device. a kill switch. Yep. Kill switch. So yeah. and, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm wondering if Bob can reach that if somebody's sitting in the passenger seat. Um, if you have a very thin hand and arm, yes, I can. I can slide it through, but it's really tight. Depends so, on how, thank you. Depends on how 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 intense the electrical problem is. <laughs> exactly. The, the the good news is that I live in Houston, Texas, and about ten months out of the year, it's too hot to drive that car. My wife won't ride in it, so it's typically me by myself anyway. <laughs> All right. <laughs> right. Hey, John. The, the big heel, just like the big Healy's. Had, a, had an honest to goodness kill switch and they had a white with black wire that ran from the, the, the distributor side of the coil all the way back to the switch. So when you turn the switch, not only did it disconnect the negative side of the battery, it also grounded out the point so the car killed. So that, that was, I don't know how many years they used that on the Healy, but um, it, it, it was there and it was mounted in the mounted in the in the booth so anyway i just broke oh john yes yeah there's another advantage to mounting the switch uh behind the passenger seat it, it might be very easy to get to with your right arm very easy whether no matter what position the seat's in and the other major advantage is it reduces your cable length to the battery which is a win-win you don't yeah. want to be draping that positive or negative voltage across the car to the other side of the, you know, to the driver's seat. Yeah, keep it short as possible. Okay. Yeah. We used to see all kinds of stuff. They come in the shop. Somebody get, you know, they mad at the twin sixes, and somebody says, "Well, just get a twelve volt." So they they get the the um, the plastic container, like for boat battery, and that'd be dancing around in the in the trunk, and then fall over, and then the acid would leak out and burn a hole in the in the bottom of the trunk. Um, but to get the cables through, you know, they take a, a cold chisel and a hammer or something or other, maybe even a hole saw, and here's this ragged hole with this wire bouncing around, <laughs> bouncing around in there. It's like, I wonder when that's going to short out, you know? Oh, my gosh. So well, I just switched the ground. Uh, yeah, there's no voltage present. So, yeah. And then you go right to the frame. So yep. if it rubs, if it rubs through, there's no harm. It's a better connection. Yep. Okay. Okay. All right. Jeff Fields. Jeff, are you still on? Jeff from Grafton, Ohio. Jeff is suggesting that we um, follow his link um, and, and, uh, um, nominate the finest MGs from Indiana uh, that you know of for this year's Dayton Concourse in mid-September. So um, we would prefer to have cars from our local clubs on the field. So if, if you are from Ohio, Indiana, uh, somewhere in there, um, Jeff Fields is a, the T-type contact in Ohio. He's always, always sending stuff out every week. Uh, to people. Anyway, he's got a, a DaytonConcourse.com website here. So, um, Crystal Johnson has the seat, uh, seat belt. She says seat restoration, but she means seat belt. And it's S Snake, S S Snake, uh, O Y L. So it's snake oil. Yeah, somebody's had a good, good time with that. Um, so Crystal does have that link on, on uh, the chat section to rebuild your, your seat belts. And it isn't just the recoil. The belts themselves, I mean, they're fabric. And oh, uh, at what point won't they support, you know, um, 250 pounds being, being ex accelerated at 60 miles an hour when the car stops suddenly? So. On, right. that, on that seatbelt, not only did they redo my webbing for me, but you know, on the Kangol seatbelts, they have those little fabric labels on the back 
Yeah. Yeah, they reproduced those and sewed those and stitched them in. Very, very nice. And they also match the uh, stitching patterns. They, they'll ask you what year your car is, and they match the stitching. Really nice job. Real, that's so nice to know. There are people out there that do all kinds of stuff. There's the damper doctor, if you want to send your front harmonic balancer from your engine and get that redone. There's the, uh, who's the rocker, doc, Dr. Doctor Rocker, Dr. Um, and they do rocker shafts. I mean, there are people, people do all kinds of, all kinds of cool stuff. So anyway, Crystal, thank you very much for that snake oil, for, for doing those seat belts. I had to rebuild my own, but mine are fixed. So I, I just, I was really, really careful taking them apart. Mr. Chapin, everybody, I cannot adjust or remove the headrest of my 72B. Pull uh, forward and up, no go. Pull back and up, no go. Do I just need to pull harder? No. Yes. Yes. So, um, <laughs> it it helps oil helps um and um wd-40 in this case pro probably so you'd spray that on the on the on the chrome stock in there and then you get into the car and put one foot on the on the on the door jam and one foot on the transmission hump if you can and then push as hard as you can to push the push the thing all the way down so that you've broken it loose, so you, you know that it works, and then grab it, and with a, a really wild karate yell, yeah! yank it with all your might, and it'll pop right out. But you have to do it like that, and you got to give the karate yell. Is there, yeah, I can do the karate yell. Is there? You don't have to pull it forward or back to release any no, no, no AMs or anything. No, but. You want to get it moving up and down first, you know. So, so it's it's tight to the top of the seat. I don't know how I can get any lubricant in it, but I can try. That's the car behind me, and I'm just okay. Yep, it, it's uh, that's that's the way it's done. Okay. When you pull, when you pull, you want to be outside so you don't take out your lights in your garage. Okay, yeah, I'll do that too. No ceiling overhead. Okay. It's been a long time since I, I pulled pulled those off. Um, but I, I remember I well, I don't know, probably in my daughter's car we probably pulled. Yeah, I know we had to pull them off because one of them didn't go back in so very easily. Um yeah, so you know, you just you gotta yell. You gotta yell. It's just it's like if you yell loud, loud enough when your hand's coming down on that concrete block, it'll that concrete block will break, you know. So just gotta yell. It's a sonic disturbance, yes. <laughs> okay, from Paul to everybody, what's the best distributor for an MGA 57 1500? Oh, I don't know. I don't have that number off the top of my head. It's up the shop. Um but the factory, the 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 factory uh, 12 degree advanced distributor is the one that you want. If you have an original, even if you don't have an original distributor, but you get a 25D, you can send it to either Schlemmer or Medinsky advanced distributor or British vacuum unit in either Minnesota or New Hampshire and get them to rebuild your distributor um, or a distributor that matches what's supposed to be there for a, a 57 MGA. I can't remember the number, um, 40162. What, what's that 4016, I think that's a TF. Uh, no, that's a TD. I can't, I can't get to a, um, I, ca I can't remember the, 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 the number, but Paul, if you wanna know the specs for that distributor, contact me and I'll, I'll take a picture of the graph of the of the advance curve, um, if you got somebody else that wants to do it, or you can just send it to Schlemmer or Medinsky, and they'll they will they will go ahead and do it. Is it worth it to go ahead and fix the maximum advance, like you did on a twenty five D? Um, the maximum advance is twelve degrees okay. on, on that MGA, which doubled as twenty four degrees. Right. 
And um, so you just got a static setting of eight. So eight plus 24 equals your 32 maximum. Right. Um, but it's it's um, very, very often the bushing shot, you know, or stuff's bent. And so, you know, I always talk about a firing angle. You know, you, you want to, I, I got to get a green screen so I can put something behind me and get <laughs> farther away. But, yeah. you know, you, you want to break in it. 0, 90, 180, 270. And once it begins to wobble, you know, when it's running, um, th then the, they're all the, over the place, right? The engines yeah. fight itself. Yeah. Right. And right. Uh, you talk to anybody who's had their distributor rebuilt, and they'll say, oh my gosh, I can't believe it made all yeah. that difference. But okay. Thank you. Okay. Tony Caputo again on the 76 midget. Um, and I, and I am using that auxiliary oil line to feed the rockers. Um, it works very well, and I've noted significantly better oiling to the rocker area, and it's very easy to install. So that's very cool. Tony, where, where, do, you, where do you get that? Where's that from? Tony, you're, you're still on? We're down to 109 people. Oh my, it's because it's, it's 919. So I don't see Tony on here, but it... it must be that it's a commercially available uh, line for that midget 1500 engine, which is really, of course, a Spitfire engine. Tony W, on sources for B kingpin assemblies, I bought uh, one from Moss a little while ago. Long story short, their internal notes said UK made, but what I got was from China, didn't quite fit right, and grease fittings were wrong. And then we have some Latin, caveat emptor. So anyway, um, I think um, for the, uh, from Nova Scotia, uh, Halifax, where we're from, um, your best bet probably is to get something in from the UK, I bet, I bet. So Craig Fowler, um, thanks so much for your wonderful advice. Um, and then uh, Pat G says the Austin Healy's have cutoff switches. And um, Gil Dupre says he's got one there. And Paul asked me and says, did, did I ever find out why the home market MGBs kept the oil cooler after 74? No, I did not. I did not. Somebody else is going to have to do that re research. I'm going to forget about it by the, by the next time. And we are down to the end. We're down to the end here. So, um, uh, Doug, are you on? Are you still on from Chicago, Doug? Yes, yes, John, I am. Yeah. What, what was our count tonight, our official count? Uh, I, I counted 171. Okay. All right. Not, not quite as many as when... Uh, uh, Blair was on talking about the LED lamps that they got. They got other people from uh, some other vehicles involved too. But I just I want to thank everybody for being on tonight. Um, uh, there's a lot of stuff in that chat section, uh, not the least of which is my PayPal button. Thank you very much. I'll see what I can do about the Venmo thing too, for Pat. I think it's Pat G from California asked me about that. Um, but I want to thank everybody um, for being on. And I want to thank Doug for wearing his hat so I, I can wear my, what's this say? Federal, Federal Reserve Police. So, yep, I've got, I've got a bunch of hats. I don't just have fifth helmets. I've got other hats too. I used to have a guy that, um, Roy, Roy Hoffman, maybe from Baraboo, Wisconsin. He came to our summer party for a number of years in a row. And every year that he came, he'd bring me a different hat. It was, uh, so I got some really unusual unusual hat. Stug and I'll have a hat off. <laughs> at our next at our next one we'll we'll, we'll see how, how bizarre we, we we can get our hats. And for having all this nice hair at my age of 74, one wonders why I keep it covered all the time. But maybe that's why I still have yeah. all this hair. I don't know. John 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 if you've got it you want to flaunt it man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah look at this full full head of hair. I don't know, I don't know how nice is that? Yeah, so well, anyway, everyone, thank you very, very kindly. Thanks, John. Good night. Lot, lot thank of you, John. Good night. Hey, hey, real pleasure. And 
If anybody has any questions, you know, you just call me, find my number on, on my website, something or other, and, and call and ask. And, and um, I was going to talk to somebody about their front end. I think they'll um, call me tomorrow. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy to help out. So it's uh, nice to see everybody on here tonight. And uh, um, hey, hey, John. hey, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure indeed. Maybe so, next week I'll wear my sombrero. Hey, wait, no, you can't. That's, uh, that's, Rodrigo, Rodrigo's got to be on the Zoom call. Yeah, that's a cultural appropriation, right? Well, so, I'm half Hispanic. It's okay. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> Bob, Bob, you're a bad gringo, man. <laughs> so anyway, I thank everybody for. Uh, for being on and, and uh, Pat, always thank you for your comments from from the uh, from the left coast and and a uh, lot of experience. You worked what, well, you worked in the dealership for years, didn't you, Pat? No, you're talking, but I can't hear you because you didn't unmute yourself. You're still talking, but I can't I can't hear you yet. Still, hit your space bar, Pat. Will 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 that help? There you go. There. Now I got it. No, John, I had an independent shop. Oh, I did okay. work in a British dealership, but I was a car salesman. <laughs> um, I'm going to hell for all those TR7s that I sold. <laughs> oh, you're the guy. <laughs> I'm so happy. They could have they could have badged that as an MG. I'm just so happy that they didn't. Oh my gosh. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, John. Hey. Gentlemen, thank you, John. Ladies. Thanks from Central California, John. Hey, thank you. Thank you Thanks, very much. John. Good night. Thank you. Good See you in a couple night. weeks. Good night from Illinois. <laughs> two weeks, John. Two weeks time. Next meeting. Uh, two weeks. I, I got it in my calendar, but yeah, two weeks is uh, uh, must make it the 24th. Yep. Okay. So, okay. All right. Till then, safety fast. Thank you. Bye-bye, John. Safety fast.